This week, we're going to be talking about benefit statements and how to use them both at work and at home. Really, when here's, here's the way I use them. When you want to be persuasive, when you want to sell an idea, when you want to tell somebody, consider this, you know, instead of what you are considering, consider this. Or, and this is a biggie, when you're telling a customer no. For example, if what is something that you might have to tell a customer? What is a request a customer might make that you'd have to decline? Uh, like Andrew, can you think of one that uh, some customer service position where a customer would ask for something and you'd have to say no to it? Um, can I get a discount? Can I get a discount? Okay. If I had to say no to that, here's how you would use a benefit statement and should use benefit statements, especially for things like that. When you tell a customer no, when you tell anybody no, if you can possibly wrap it up in a benefit for them, that is really customer service excellence. Unfortunately, Andrew, if I were to offer you a discount, I wouldn't be able to provide you the quality that we can uh, offer you in this product. So unfortunately, the, today that's going to have to be a no. But what I can do is offer you my employee discount <laughs> so that you can enjoy something off of this and keeping it in your budget while maintaining the quality of the product that you are used to with us. You know, I want to tell you the reason we can't do that is because of you. Like what's another thing that somebody might ask Andrew where you'd have to say no to it? Well, Jupiter 1111 says refunds. Refunds. Okay. Like for what? Give me an example. Me? Or... <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, okay, for example, Jupiter, uh, let's say that they're asking for a refund. Um, Wow. Okay. For a fee that I paid, ah, like at the bank. <laughs> Not that I pay fees at the bank, but let's say that I were to call up and I were to say, Hey, you know, I've been banking with you for 15 years and it was just a mistake when my check didn't show up as I thought it would. And because of the way you processed the checks, I had, you know, over $75 in, in non-sufficient fund charges. <laughs> Could you please refund some of those just as a gesture of goodwill? And they told me no. And the way that they told me no was they said something like, <laughs> wait a minute. I mean, in my if this had happened to me, which it of course doesn't, they would have said no. And they may have said something like, here's what they said. They said, uh, no, Dan, we can't give you, we can't refund any of those charges because that was your fault. And that's the way it is, was basically their answer. That was your fault, you bounced the checks, and well, they covered them, but therefore you're going to have to pay that and we're not refunding it. If it were, all, if it were our fault, maybe, but it was yours. Had they simply said to me, oh, Mr. O'Connor, I understand how frustrating it is when you have to pay those charges, but unfortunately, so that we can keep our costs low for not just you, but all of our customers, we can only offer a refund once every 90 days. And looking at your account, I can see you've already had a refund. What I can do, however, is set you up on automatic, uh, what do you call it? Automatic um, NSF covering so that when your account gets low, it'll take it out of your savings account instead of just bouncing the check. Would you like me to set that up for you now? Now, had they said that, Totally different story. You know, I would have felt good about it. I would have felt like, yeah, well, okay, they're doing the best they can to keep my costs down and they offered me a solution. So benefit statements are not just for salespeople. You know, benefit statements are things, you know, hey, Andrew, how would you like to run to the store for me so that you can get out a little bit earlier today? You know, if I'm gonna tell him I want something from him, I'm going to tell him what the benefit is for him. If there is no benefit in it for him, why would I ask? You know, well, in our particular dynamic, you know, I guess I would ask for lots of things where there's not a whole lot of benefit for, for Andrew. But under normal circumstances, when I'm asking somebody to do something, like a coworker, if I do not have a benefit in it for you, it would be rude of me to ask you to do most things that we ask people to do at work when we don't give them a benefit statement. Uh, if I wanted my kids, you know, to, not that I have kids, but if I, if I wanted, Buddy, for example, we just gave him a, a flea drops and he hates those. But Buddy, we're going to give you these flea drops so that you can be so that you can sleep well tonight and not be scratching all night for the first time in three days. I'm going to tell you what's in it for you. That seems very simple, right? I mean, seems like a simple concept, right? OK, most people could not deliver a benefit statement for the life of them. 
And it's a really simple trick when you learn how to do it. There are two lead-in lines that you can use to ensure that you're, deal that you're delivering a benefit statement. And remember that there are two sides to the brain, you know? There's the left-hand side, the logical side, and there's the right-hand side, the emotional side. Now, th there's been studies done recently where there's, they put the left and the right, which is creative, which is logical, in dispute. I don't know, I do not have these brain machines at home, but I'm just going to say for the sake of argument, there are the two sides to the brain that we know. And one side tends to be the more creative side, one side tends to be the more logical side. When you want someone to make a decision to buy what it is that you're selling, you know, I want you to buy my idea, I want you to go along with my way of thinking. I want to be persuasive, convincing. We make decisions in which side of the brain, Andrew? Logical or emotional? Emotional. Emotional. Then we back them up with logic. You know, when I'm deciding what kind of a car to buy, we fool ourselves thinking, some of us, you know, we fool ourselves thinking that you know, we're very logical buyers and we, you know, we, we planned to buy the, the Ford Taurus and that's what we bought because it had good mileage and it had good this and it had blah, 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 blah. But the reality is 90% of us make decisions purely based on emotion and then back them up with logic. That's what we do. Even when we meet people, you know, we meet people and we snap judge them. And then we don't like to fancy ourselves bad judges of character. So we take the the, the, what do you call them? The uh, conscious cues. And we put them together and we back up our initial assessment generally with logic. Just like when we buy a car, we tend to make a decision based on emotion and then back it up with logic. Same when we buy a house. However, when we are selling a house or a car, most people can't stick between logic and emotion in their speech patterns. So I'm going to show you how to do that. I want to speak to the, the emotional side of the brain when I want you to make that decision. Once it's done, I can tell you what a good decision you made and back it up with logic. And leading up to the decision-making process, I can give you the facts and figures and the logic that maybe you want to balance out your emotional decision, which you're eventually going to make. But Andrew, yes. have you bought a car lately? No. Okay, Andrew uh, was driving my car today. Andrew. What kind of a car do I have? <laughs> you have a Cadillac. I have a big black Cadillac. And uh, I have a car life, actually. So that you might think is a selling point of that car. Well, it's very elegant. Oh, it's elegante. Yes, it is. What else? It has leather. Leather seats. OK, what else? It has, it's like a muscle car. So it is a muscle car. It has like a Mustang engine. I love it, right? OK, so. Let's say that I did not know any better. Andrew comes up, you know, he looks like a rube. He knows that I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this sucker and I'm gonna sell him a Cadillac, okay? If I did not know any better, I would say things like, if, he, if I knew that he was looking for a car with leather seats and an elegant car that moved like a Mustang, I might say to him, oh, Andrew, have I got the car for you? Look at this. It is super elegante, brand new black paint job. It's all sleek and shiny. In addition, it's got leather seats. Ooh, look at that. These are fancy, fancy seats. And it goes from zero to 60 in what would be fast? Um, first. 10 seconds. Okay. And what do most people say at that point when I explain the features or when I explain, because a lot of people would think those would be benefits. You know, the benefit of the car is in 10 seconds. That's logical language. So if I were to say just that, most people at that point would say, what do they say, Andrew? How much does it cost? Uh, 200,000 pesos. Might as well be rubies for most of us. So what do you say? You gonna take it, Andrew? What do most people say? I would have to check and see other cars. Yes, to go in this direction because this, that, and the other. I believe, Mr. Customer, that you should take this with benefit statements. Repeat that after me. So that you, so you can. One more time. So that you, so, Andrew, wow. so that you, so you can. If you say it three times, write it down and read it and use it, it is yours because now you've heard it more than three times. Remember, this car has leather seats so that you can get, what is, why, why do car, what's the benefit of leather seats? Why do you like those? They're leather. So what? 
benefits of leather seats is so that you don't have to clean them as often as you would cloth seats and so that you can get in and out of them without getting yourself dirty because Mexico is kind of a dusty place, you know, it is. And leather seats are easy to keep clean so that you can keep clean. Leather seats are easy to care for so that you do not have to replace them as often as you would cloth seats. This car is the car, the, the black gloss that you were looking for. It is an elegant car so that you will look elegant as you drive down the street so that when you go to pick up a girlfriend, they will think, oh, Andrew, you're so fancy. And this car goes from 60 to zero to steep, gets decent mileage for what it is. And the benefit is not that it gets good mileage. The benefit is, well, it gets good mileage so that you can save money at the pump. See what I mean? Anytime you're delivering a logical statement, saying, any proposal that you give, if you're giving it to the board, if it's about a company, I believe we could implement this procedure so that we can enjoy a more unified staff, so that we can more effectively manage change. I believe that we should implement Your wife would appreciate it when you go home at the end of the day because you'd be able to speak to her in a way that you've never spoken before, so that she will love her. Those are benefit statements. And remember, by the way, when you are to say no to a customer, I mean, nobody, that's not the way it's supposed to go. I'm not supposed to say no to my boss. You know, if my boss says to me, Dan, I need that report at the end of the day, and I need to tell you, oh, I cannot do that. You're not somebody that I'm supposed to be saying no to. Like Andrew, you know, if he were to say, hey, Dan, what do you ask me for, Andrew? Hey, Dan, can I take the car? No way. See, that's normal. But if he were my boss and were to say, Dan, could you please stay after work and finish this video? I might say to him, oh, Andrew, unfortunately, the best route would be for me to finish that tomorrow so that you can get the quality that you expect in the videos. That and Andrew, it's all for you. You know, can I, I when you go to Burger King, <laughs> you know, I just had somebody ask when I went to the Burger King in the, in the, uh, airport they asked if they could see a, if they could have a tour because when i was a kid they would give us tours of burger king that where they would make the burgers did you know that no yeah they just bring you back there and we could see within the fire pit i remember the whole operation i was fascinated and the the chain belt the belt that they would come out on and i loved it you know those are back in the days where you know safety first smirced you know you could stick your hand right in the grill and that it was a different day so i told my friend hey let's ask it for if you can get a uh a tour and they were like what no 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 now granted that is simply a burger king guadalajara employee burger king generally has better customer service training than that mcdonald's absolutely has superior customer service training because they might know to say something at mcdonald's just if i had to guess they'd be more apt to say something like oh unfortunately i can't let you have to decline your request. However, I can show you a video on YouTube where you can check out the entire process close up and in 3D. Would you like that? And now remember, when you give somebody a, an option, instead of simply saying, what I can, when you follow up a, an offer with a, would you like that? Internally or externally, that is going to person and I'm saying yes to them when they're asking me if I like something you know would I like that Ooh, I'm just filled with likes and pleasure day-to-day -day experiences when you need to tell somebody well unfortunately you asked for this but you're not getting it but I'll tell you why it's so that you can receive the benefit so that you so you can there you go uh, in addition to that today I want to talk about label planting label planting is huge Huge, 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 huge. It's a secret covert tactic that almost nobody knows to implement and it's super easy. And if you do it, you can decide what your customers say about you. You know, like if you have a survey that you send out to your customers and you were to ask them, you know, how would you describe this department? How would you describe your experience working with us? How would you describe our products? 
If you do not have that, you need to get that. But I'm assuming that most of you have that, you know, some way where people give you feedback. How would you like to increase the odds of getting the feedback you want specifically? You know, I want people to say we are helpful. I want people to say it is a pleasure walking in and out of there. I want people to say, what, Andrew? What do you want people to say about you? That I'm a kind person. He is such a kiss up that I'm a kind person. You know, your mother's not watching this. Yes, she is. Oh, she is. Okay. Well, Andrew. Okay. So he wants people to describe him as a kind person. Okay. So what he's going to do is use the word kind. <laughs> That's going to be a difficult one. But when he's talking to me, the more he uses the word kind, like what is an, what is an example where you would actually be able to use the word kind uh, or compassionate, like in a conversation? Kindly do that. Oh, there you go. That's perfect, Andrew. I will kindly do. Dan, will you kindly get that for me? The more he does that, if you were to take a survey of 100 people and 100 people surveyed, how would you describe Andrew? Survey says. I'm guessing nobody at this point would say kind, just because that's not a word people generally use, right? Well, they, they're saying I'm, I'm a kind person. Oh, you are. He's a kind person. That's not a word that they would generally use in Ajijic, Mexico, <laughs> right? They would say at least, how do you say kind in Spanish? Amable. Amable. They might say that. But amable is different. You know, amable is like friendly, but kind is like Buddha or Mother Teresa, although I heard she was not that kind. But you know what I mean? Kind is, I'm gentle. <gasps> Jesus, what was that? <laughs> you know, oh, you know what kind, how would you, is there a specific word for kind in Spanish? Uh, Think about that one. Because friendly is amistoso. Oh, Yeah. and kind is what then? Amable. Amable. So when people say, oh, people say muy amable, very kind of you. Oh. Oh, been there 25 years, didn't know that. When, however, if you've been to the Camelback Marriott in Phoenix, Arizona, anybody been there? Raise your hand if you've been there. Camelback Marriott's, give us a shout out. If you have been to the Camelback Marriott, oh, if you have been there, please give a shout out because I would like to know how you would describe that, okay? Uh, anybody been there online, in, Andrew? Um, the, 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 they say to be more kind to me. Uh, the, the Connor boy says he has. Well, Marty, is that my brother? Yes. Oh, hi, Marty. Hey, Marty. You know, Marty's all, we're going to talk about love languages in our upcoming uh, The Prophet, dealing with difficult person. Marty was at the Camelback Marriott in Phoenix. I think I was actually with Marty. Um, Marty, in one word, how would you describe your experience at the Camelback Marriott in Phoenix? Or it might be, yes, yeah, Phoenix, Arizona. How would you describe it, Marty? Um, give him a sec. He's saying hello to everybody. Marty, this is not a tea party. We're looking for one word describing the experience you had at the Camelback Marriott. Memorable. Memorable. You get the gong. I'm sorry, Marty, but you can go. <laughs> when you go to the Camelback Marriott, here's what they do. You walk in and Andrew, Andrew is, is at the front desk, so he gives me a bottle of water, and I say, thank you. How might you respond, Andrew? If you, just, if you just started there and you did not know how they label plant, how might you say, if I were to say thank you for the bottle of water? You're welcome. You're welcome. Very nice. Okay. Okay, Andrew. Now he gives me my key. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now I'm going up to my floor. And, oh, wait a minute, before I do that, I go up and I talk to the man in the AV department and I say, could I get an extra battery for my mic coming up this, this evening when I do the keynote? Could you make sure that there's an extra battery around? Yes. Yes, I will do that. Okay, now I'm asking the housekeeping. Excuse me, do you know, could you point me to the bathroom? Down the hall to the left. Down the hall to the left. Now I'm up in my room and I call down and I say, Hey, could you connect me with Marty O'Connor's room? No, we can't. <laughs> now, all of those opportunities were opportunities to label plant. And to label plant means I'm going to, oh, you'll see this in politics these days, no matter, you know, who, who, no matter who you vote for. 
you will see that a strategy that politicians use is they are just going to keep saying words, the same words over and over again. Sometimes they're true, sometimes they're total fantasy, but they're going to keep saying them until they get implanted in your mind and people start to use those words to describe the candidates. Whether there's a truth to it or not, this strategy works. The Camelback Marriott, when they want their customers to describe them, they want their customers to describe them and their experience as a pleasurable one. They want their customers to say, ooh, I was alive with pleasure. Ooh, it was the most pleasurable place I've ever been. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. It was like, I was, I, it's, I, it was this, I was titillated with pleasure, okay? That's what they want. So what they do is, Andrew, thanks for the bottle of water. How could you now plant that label in what you say to me? It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Okay, so now I'm gonna say thanks for the room key. My pleasure. And now I'm gonna say, hey, could you get me an extra battery? Now don't just say it's my pleasure. Use a whole sentence. Okay. It could, you could still say my pleasure, but make a whole sentence out of that. Could I get an extra battery for my battery pack? Of course, let me check downstairs. It'd be my pleasure to do that for you, Mr. O'Connor. Right? Yes. <laughs> now the one that really got me when I knew, I heard it and I passed out of delight because I was up in my room and I called down to the front desk and I said, I was actually looking for Miss Dixon. Crystal Dixon is one of my sisters. and. I called down and I said, hello, could you connect me with Miss Dixon's room, please? And Andrew, this is, this is a big one. Now, if Andrew can get this, I might pass out. How might you phrase the yes, I will connect you, planting the label of pleasure in it? It would be my pleasure to connect you. That was it! That's what, no, that was pretty close. It would be my pleasure to connect you, perfect. The way that they said it was, I'll connect you with pleasure, Mr. O'Connor. And when they connected me, I was like, wait, wait, I don't want to be connected. Oh, they're connecting me with her room. I kind of thought that they were like this magic fairy who was connecting me directly with pleasure. And it felt so good, I called back three times to keep, <laughs> keep doing it. And I thought to myself, they are good. They are learning to say things like, I'll connect you with pleasure. It'd be my pleasure. It's our pleasure to help. It's, everything to them is a pleasure. If you look at the USA Today newspaper, in the top 10 rated hotels in the United States. We have hotels that are out of this world. You know what I mean? We have the Four Seasons. We have uh, the JW Marriott's. There are all sorts of hotels that I'm sure would like to be on the top 10 list. You will always find the Camelback Marriott at the top 10 of the most pleasurable hotels in the United States rated by business travelers. Right in the front page of the USA Today newspaper once a year, and I know their secret. It's because they plant that label so deep in your brain. When those customers are asked, how was your experience there? Oh my God, I was alive with pleasure. It was so pleasurable. It was one of the most pleasurable places I've ever been. They'll spit it out. That is called label planting. So if you want to be thought of as efficient, when answering a question from a customer, well, I believe that the most efficient way to go about that would be, and then do that. If you want to be thought of as uh, accurate, you know, could you hold for one moment so that I can get you the most accurate information? You know, when you're asking people to hold, you know, of course, so that you can, you know, so that you can enjoy the most accurate information, so that I can get you the most accurate information. Hey, Dan. Yes. But when label planting, doesn't it come a little like sucking up? No, label planting is, I know the language that I'm supposed to be speaking in this situation. It's like if I were sitting down with, uh, Andrew, do both of your sisters speak Spanish? I mean, excuse me, speak English as well? They understand English. Okay. Olga? Amor? Ben, Ben, Ben. Okay, this is Olga. Olga is my, 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 the love of my life. Okay. Olga, mi amor. Diles. If I speak to you in English, are you going to be understanding what I'm saying? Ya ves, ella es como Daniel, ¿por qué no me estás hablando en mi idioma? ¿Verdad? She's thinking, yep, she's thinking and she just said, yeah, why aren't you speaking to me in my language? Gracias, amor. Mua, te amo. Now, that was the lovely and talented Olga. She does not speak English. 
if I did not speak to her in her language, she wouldn't get what I'm saying. If I deliberately speak her language, you know, I know this situation calls for this language, Spanish. That's not sucking up, you know, what I mean? but I understand your question because a lot of people struggle with that. You know, they don't want to be fake or they don't want to put on airs or, you know, speak some language just to, you know, they feel like they're being disingenuous somehow. If I did not learn and then speak her language to her, she wouldn't get the message that I'm sending. <laughs> Therefore, I do that for the both of us. And that's not, that's not uh, you know, being phony. It's learning to speak the right language so that I can get the message across. Because the message that I want to send to my customers is, you are going to drop dead from pleasure when you are here. But to be able to articulate that is a skill. It's a talent. It's a special language. Just like Andrew, Andrew, Andrew's been asking me a lot of advice lately for, you know, how to, how to speak the language of love in the boudoir, right, Andrew? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, okay, if you are with your lover in the bedroom with the lights down low, okay, Marty, plug your ears. The way that you would speak to your lover in that situation, if you want to be romantic and, you know, you want the phenylethylamine to flow and you want to make this, you know, a... Uh, 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 <laughs> tonight, if you want to celebrate your love for them, the language that you would speak in that situation, would that be different from the language that you would speak to your boss the next day at work? I'm assuming that that's a different person, you know what I mean? Would it be different from the language that you would speak? If I were to pass a baby around, you know, everybody who's watching this right now, so that everybody were to hold a baby, when we hold a baby, we instinctively change the way we speak. You know, we start, oh, we start to change our tone, the words, our patterns, our gestures, everything changes because the language is different and it's appropriate for me to change the way that I communicate. That's called style stepping. When I'm talking to my dogs, I change the way that I communicate with them because they expect a certain language from me and then they understand it. So we change our language a lot. You know what I mean? I speak to my lover the way I differently from how I would speak to a customer at work because that's appropriate <laughs> you know what I mean we want to be able to recognize when we should shift our language you know for example in uh, many cultures I if I'm meeting a stranger I'm going to speak to you differently and use different uh, tenses and different phrases if I don't know you than if I do know you, because what I'm doing is I'm actually, that's, that's made to set a separation between me and that person. We are separating ourselves, which is going to show respect. You know, in the business, business communication used to be more formal. And that was because I'm trying to set a separation between myself and my, and my subordinate. And there should be a separation, you know, according to the theory between the subordinate and his or her boss. Therefore, we speak to them differently from how I would speak to a colleague. That's just what it is, you know. Nowadays, we want to actually remove the separation. And so I want to speak to my customers the same way as I might speak to my friend. In many cultures, that separation, though, is still there. And if I, for example, were to meet somebody, young or old, depending on where they're from, if I were to start speaking to them using the same tenses as I might speak to Andrew, they'd be like, don't you tute me? You know, don't, don't you speak to me that familiar. Don't you, don't you get fresh with me, young man. And which is a challenge for me because, you know, Spanish is my second language. So sometimes it's difficult for me to speak in the formal tense, which still really exists. So that long answer to your question is absolutely not. It's like if you go into a, uh, you know, how sometimes you'll go into a store or you'll be at a restaurant or something. You'll be talking to a, one of your kid's friends and they can communicate in such a beautiful way. I mean, you can tell how much their parents invested in them and their communication skills and they, you know, the words just flow and their tenses are all correct and they don't mispronounce things and they don't make verbal typos and just everything that they say is like a, it's like a sonnet, you know? It's like a song coming out of their mouth when they speak. That's a beautiful thing and you recognize that and you're like, wow. The same goes for when you recognize somebody is delivering excellent customer service. You know, if you go to the Four Seasons that front desk person is going to speak to you differently from how they would speak to their friends because that's the level there. You know, they want you to know, 
I have invested so much in my skills. I'm going to show it to you by the way that I communicate with you. And therefore, you're going to trust that everything else beneath the surface, beneath the surface has received this much attention and care. So don't ever, ever be afraid to style step. It is honoring the person to whom you are speaking. Making enough noise over there, Andrew? You have a little, you have a little drum beat going on? Okay, there was one other thing though that I wanted to make sure we threw in. We got benefit statements, label planting. Uh, customer service. That's all customer service as well. Jupiter tipped us $20. Jupiter! I think she tipped us 20 bucks the last time. Yes. Jupiter, you are the bomb. Take note. <laughs> Thank you, Jupiter. Um, let me know what we can do for you. You know, anything that, any, anything that, that Andrew can do, no, anything that, uh, anything that either one of us can do, we'd really appreciate that. And by the way, uh, I think Jupiter is also a member, right? And no. if, whether you are or not Jupiter, if you could tell me, what do you think, since you're, you're right now my universe, Jupiter, uh, what do you think would be a perk that we should offer in this channel if people become a member? I'm currently not offering any because I really, the whole concept is new to me, and uh, I would like anyone's input that's willing to give it. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you so much for always giving so much. Thank you. Who wrote that? Uh, Jupiter. Jupiter! <laughs> Jupiter, you're going to make me pass out and blush at the same time. Thank you very much. Um, what other, do we have any questions, Andrew? You could ask. Uh, oh, look at the question box. Oh, the question box. Okay. Hold on. Okay, I need my Tony Stark glasses. Uh, thank you, answer number one. Okay, well, let's, let's see if it was this one. Le, Le, Lorena, Lorena Come Forel. Lorena, how to stop interrupters who are just rude when you're speaking to someone? Okay, is the, excuse me, is the interrupter Lorena, I'm gonna, here's what I'm gonna do. Lorena's asking how do you stop an interrupter? There's a three-step process. Lorena, if you ever watch Judge Judy, she delivers this process, and I'm not saying that we should do it as Judge Judy does it, but Judge Judy is a very powerful communicator. You know, she, she really knows how to structure a sentence. I have never heard her misplace a word in any sentence she's ever uttered. And I watch, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an addict, I watch her interviews. She has a three-step process for stopping an interrupter. It's the anti-interrupter. These are the three things. Now you want to practice this, Lorena, because remember that when somebody tries to interrupt you, you know, if this is my mom or my grandma, my brother, you know, generally speaking, when people interrupt us, it's because they're so enthralled in what we're saying, they can't wait to join the conversation with us. So no problem. You know, I'll, I'll forgive you for that, for being so enthralled. However, if somebody's maliciously trying to interrupt you, which is what I'm assuming you're talking about here, that's when you need to say no, because you're trying to reset the laws of power here and rewrite the rules of engagement is what you're doing. Not here. So do this. Practice this when you don't need it for when you do need it. Number one, make direct eye contact and head forward, excuse me, head, <laughs> head tilt forward, okay? Direct eye contact head tilt forward. You can even, in this situation, open up your eyes a little wider than you normally would. Because normally when you can see the whole iris of your eye, it's a sign of aggression and psychosis, and you want to avoid that. In this case, you can be aggressive. I don't think people will think you're psychotic in this particular instance. Uh, step number two, while you're delivering the head nod forward and the eyes wide, you want to deliver a stop gesture. Now, the universal stop, stop gesture is that. That everyone will understand that and remember Andrew look at look up for a second if I'm gonna say that like Andrew say hello Andrew my name is Andrew hello, my stop name. now if you're to do that to the average person just that hand gesture it feels bad doesn't it yes. it feels bad I apologize Andrew I didn't want to make you feel bad uh, but that gesture gets people to stop no matter what their language is. That's the universal stop gesture. Now, Judge Judy, she will give you a karate chop. She'll be like, I'm speaking. Now that's Judge Judy. That's a little too aggressive for me. I don't want to you know, encourage people to, to, even if it's give an air karate chop, it's not something we encourage. Number three, deliver a anti-interrupter statement. 
the most common thing that people will say when someone tries to interrupt them is what? Like if, like I'm, you're speaking, I want to seal the floor from you so that I can diminish your power and rewrite the rules of engagement between the two of us. So I just say, hey, you know, just, just to add to that, and I start to steal your thunder, what does the average person say to try and take back the floor? Um, I was talking. Oh, that's actually really good. The average person, what are the first words out of most people's mouths before I was talking? Um. They'll say, um, excuse me, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry I was speaking. Um, pardon me, I was, I haven't finished. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't finished. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, pardon me, I'm sorry. All of that is garbage. Do not say that. And you will notice nine out of 10 people say exactly that. Excuse me, I haven't finished. Pardon me. And then, then the interrupter, if they say things like, all right, go ahead and finish. They will say things like, thank you. And then keep going. No, 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 no. <laughs> if somebody, now, excuse me, when you stop them from interrupting, if they say something like, go ahead, make sure that you counter that with something like, oh, I'm going to go ahead, regardless of whether or not, or re, excuse me, oh, I'm going to go ahead, regardless of whether or not you think you're giving me permission, and then you keep going. But the three steps are, you say, you know, while you're speaking, if somebody tries to steal the floor, if you can do this, if you can avoid saying, you know, the whole, I'm sorry, I haven't finished speaking, excuse me. No, all of that you can figure out when I say I'm speaking and then you keep speaking without stopping. So if Andrew were to try and interrupt me, and this is in a, you know, this is, this is an aggressive communication tactic. However, it's exactly what you might need if somebody's doing what Lorena was talking about. So you wanna be talking and talking. And imagine if you were watching two people Somebody was delivering a presentation and the person sitting next to them was rude and tried to steal their thunder and interrupt them. And that person, without even missing a beat, looked over to them and said, I'm speaking. And then they kept speaking. And if they tried again, they would say, I'm still speaking. You only have two choices when it comes to your anti-interrupter statements. It's what Andrew said, I'm speaking or I'm still speaking. All of the rest of the you can speak when I'm done, you'll figure that out by me saying, I'm speaking, and then you keep speaking without stopping. Now, if somebody is just a, what you call a steamroller, and they're going, I'm gonna keep, I'm just gonna talk over you, and I'm gonna keep on talking. We know the average person to counter that would just try to talk over them, and then, oh yeah, well, they'll just get louder, and then the other person gets louder. Don't do that. When our kids wanna interrupt us, you know, like if we're on the telephone and we're, you know, saying, hey, honey, I've got an important phone call to make, so please give me 10 minutes. I'm, I'm not here, you know? What do our kids do when they want to get our attention, Andrew? They just say our name. They just say our name. Did you watch this video that I did already? Yes. <laughs> <Good> that, <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Did you really? Uh, no. Oh, well. <laughs> they'll say, mom, 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 mom. And we might think to ourselves sometimes, I'm not going to answer this time because that'll be giving in. I'm not going to give in. You know, and then we'll keep talking. We're like, I'm going to change my name. That is driving me crazy. You know, so we'll, we'll, we'll think, no, I'm not going to do it. 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 And then what will we eventually do most of us 99% of the time? Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll say, what? And the kids will be like, ha, works every time. And they'll do that. You know, they'll keep doing it and doing it and doing it because they know what gets rewarded gets repeated. If people can interrupt you, what gets rewarded gets repeated. If they cannot, you know, if you will turn to them and let them know, I'm speaking and then you keep speaking and then when you're done, now you can go ahead. I'm going to give you permission. You know, so remember, if somebody says something like, go ahead, I'm going to go ahead. And then you keep speaking, you know, do not let people give you permission to communicate ever, unless it's like your mom. She can give me permission. That's it. What else do we have? Oh, did that answer your question, Lorena? Lorena? Yes, she said, uh, I, will try to do, I will try that. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Remember, one, two, three. One, eye contact, forward nod. Two, an anti-interrupter gesture. Three, an anti-interrupter statement. I'm speaking and then you keep speaking. Don't miss a beat. Practice that when you don't need it so that when you do need it, it'll roll off, okay? Hey, Ebony, how to deal with workplace gossip. Ha, 
You know what? I'm going to do a seminar, a webinar on that because that's a huge topic, how to deal with workplace gossip. The big policy or statement or ramifications, the, the company, you know, the people who are in charge do not have a position. Therefore, if you don't take a stand against something, you know, like if, for example, Marty, if I don't take a stand against racism, I'm complicit in acts of racism. If I don't take a stand against workplace gossip and negativity, I'm complicit in contributing to it. We can take a stand in many different ways. I can take a stand by removing myself from the room. I can take a stand by verbalizing my, uh, my, uh, <laughs> verbalizing my, give me the word, you, for my, I, that I'm against it. I can take a stand in many different ways, but if a company does not have any position on workplace gossip and we don't have visual cues, you know, visual cues are always key, you're going to have a problem. So if you're talking about on an individual basis, you know, how do I deal with people gossiping around me? You know, there are ways, of course, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do more on that. I'm actually going to, I think I'm going to do a webinar on that, Ebony. So if you uh, remember, subscribe to danoconnertraining.com and you'll get a notice when that comes out. Also, remember, if you have your VIP membership, that will <laughs> include any webinars upcoming till the end of time, Ebony. Uh, and a program. I have actually right now a webinar in our store or a course on dealing with workplace gossip. Don't I? I don't know if it's published. I'm going to make sure that I publish that because I do have a webinar on dealing with workplace neg neg gossip and negative chatter. Uh, anything in our store, you can download and listen to the nine principles, all of it with your VIP membership. And the VIP membership, I've just put it on sale forever for 50% uh, off until at the end of this year, there's a new course that I'm coming out with. Once that course comes out, we're almost at the end of the year, then the sale is over, done, say goodbye, and you'll cry. So make sure to get your VIP membership now if you have not done that. Because um, it, it, you'll never have to pay again and you get everything till the end of time. Oh, they ask how do you get uh, Dan to answer my email? Is that my brother? No, that's Joshua. Oh, Joshua? Joshua. Joshua? Yeah. Is Joshua a boy or a girl? The, the a man or a woman? We don't do. <laughs> distinctions here. Oh, I was just wondering because uh, I, I really, I think he's boy. Okay. Ah, then I think I know who it is. <laughs> People frequently ask me how, how, or they ask my brother actually, the most common thing my brother gets asked is how can I get Dan to answer my emails <laughs> or to answer my phone calls? And here's my challenge. I don't know how people do it. I do not know how people can keep up with their emails and their phone calls and their texts and their this and I, I don't know because I get thousands a day and they're from people I don't know, people I do know, spam. I mean, it's, you know, it's not a great, I'm, I just happen to get thousands a day and I don't know what to do. Maybe if they email Jean, she could take a look at it. Then Jean starts to get thousands a day and she starts to go crazy and pull her hair out of her head. Um, well, M Marty offered to mail him. Yeah. If you email Marty, no, but not not you, <laughs> Joseph, <laughs> but Marty, uh, actually, if you have a pressing question, email my brother, Marty, no, wait, Martin at oc2interactive.com. Let me... Marty, post your email, will you? You get spammed <laughs> till the end of time. If you have a communication question or a business question like that, Marty would be a, gr a great one. He's very good at responding. And I just, I'm, I'm looking for somebody to help me with that, meaning help me learn how to do that. It wasn't too long ago that I, this is my shame, by the way, I'm, I'm revealing my shame to everybody here, so take a good look. When, not too long ago, I, my mother and I wiped out my email inbox because I figured we were both like, we are so <laughs> lost. And there was like 35,000 unread messages in my inbox. We just wanted to start over. So we did. And we, it, we erased it all and started from scratch. 
Andrew, how many unread emails do I have in my inbox today? Now this... 2,000... Oh, that's it? No. A few, we have a few thousand. You have a couple thousand. That's in one of the... That's in my... That's in one inbox. And that's just with... That's just recently. I don't know how to do it. Okay? So, if anybody has a good program or tip or, you know, course, literally, on how to clear out your inbox and your messages and how to do that while still working, you know, because I don't, I'm from the 80s where I would, you know, I'm used to when I, you know, when I work, I like to turn my phone off at the, in the morning and then in the evening, oh, I turn it back on again, just like it was 1985, you know, and all of the people who wanted to contact me during the day, I was working. My brother's really good at answering people. I don't know when he gets any work done. I know he does. I just don't know how he does it. He's a, he's a, he's a modern marvel of communication. Um, I think we have to go, Andrew, but do you have any, do you have any questions there before we do? Uh, well, if Marty, how do I get Dan to answer my email? Well, if Marty could post his email, that would be... Marty, if you could post your email, that would be great. It is martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, at oc2interactive.com. There you go, Mart. <laughs> so Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, at OC2Interactive.com. By the way, if you would like, if you're anywhere in the Minneapolis area, he is, he's a, he's a Van Gogh of painting. He runs a painting company right now. Not only does he run it with integrity and treats people the way most people claim they believe people should be treated. He actually does that. Uh, it's, it's like a work of art, everything that he does. If you need any painting done, call him. Also, no matter where you are in the world, he's an international color consultant, and there's not many of those. He will come out and, you know, sit in the middle of a room. It's kind of weird. And he'll look around, you know, different times of the day, and he'll just tell you what colors should be on what walls and exteriors, interiors. I've never seen anybody with that gift, like my brother. You know, he's kind of, he kind of missed his calling. I think he should have been, you know, on our team. Uh, I mean, my team, not Andrew's team. Andrew's in a different team. Okay. Uh, what? Uh, what's? What any? What any? Any pressing emails that we should answer or questions? No, I think we are good to wrap it up. Good to wrap it up. Okay. Everybody wants to say hi normally to Buddy and Maggie. So Maggie is asleep, and Buddy he has fleas. So I apologize. That's not my fault. There are horses in front of my home. For everybody here at Dan O'Connor Training, I'm going to be coming out. Oh, remember the profit is the next. Uh, is the next difficult, or is the next critic. I'm, I'm editing that video right now. And, and that's going to be a premiere event. It's going to be a premiere event tomorrow or the next day. I don't know when, but I hope within the next two days. And remember to support this channel. Become, consider becoming a member of this channel by click, clicking the join button below. And for all of the resources that I have to offer from now till the end of time, take advantage of the VIP all access pass that's still on sale until I don't know when. It's going to be off sale soon and you can enjoy everything from now till the end of time. So for everybody here at Dan O'Connor 